The following is a hoop ball presentation. Welcome to the Fantasy NBA Today podcast. Salutations, everyone. Welcome to this Tuesday edition of Fantasy NBA Today, a hoop ball presentation. I'm your host, Dan Bespris. We'll be talking to Adam King in just a matter of moments in a, a first of many, I'm hoping, segments that Adam and I will do together over the course of this NBA campaign. Uh, big show today, so I want to just dive right on into things. The NBA news of the day, Karis LeVert back at full practice as of today. That is a really big deal because there were fears, I know I had some, that this back thing was going to spiral a little bit and become a sort of a season-defining injury, and I guess it still could, um, but it sounds like he's getting close to coming back. That's basically going to put an arrow through Chris Duarte. Uh, I'm sure they'll try to find him some minutes out there because he's their sort of young, fun rookie, but uh, Lavert's going to be getting a lot of those touches, and it's going to have an impact on guys like Malcolm Brogdon and Damanis Sabonis as well. Uh, P.J. Washington will not play tomorrow, so that leaves Mason Plumley out there for a potential stream. Terry Rozier is doubtful for tomorrow, which also means that Kelly Oubre is out there for another stream. And Zion Williamson is set for more tests early next week. That doesn't sound great. Oh, and one more that almost slipped by. First of all, Daryl Morey said things are moving in a positive direction with Ben Simmons, but I sort of don't care about that until we see something tangible. Pascal Siakam back at practice for the Raptors. So if you thought their front court rotation was a furious cluster mess before, just you wait. As far as Monday is concerned, I want to do more of an abridged box score review on the uh, nine-game Monday slate because Adam and I have a lot to cover today and also the, the Tuesday homework assignment, only five games tonight. So let's see if we can bang this out in the next five or six minutes. Milwaukee, Indiana, not a whole lot there to dive into. Pretty much the status quo. Boston, Charlotte, similarly status quo-y. No Al Horford. Marcus Smart, by the way, here's a quick note. Uh, Just three for 12 shooting. He's gotten off to a bit of a slow start, although the non-scoring stuff for Smart has actually been pretty good to this point. And it's why he's number 88, despite shooting 27.5% from the field. So nowhere to go but up for Marcus. He's actually maybe a little bit of a buy low, although the steals probably come down a little bit. Talked post-game about dealing with migraines. And maybe that's playing a part in what's going on so far. So uh, a lot of reasons to like Marcus Smart. I know people are pissed right now because he scored just 7 points and he had a goose egg in a ball game earlier. Uh, But do not fret. Life is A-OK. Nothing of note on that Charlotte side. We already mentioned the injury stuff going on. Detroit uh, Detroit was interesting because Jeremy Grant missed this ballgame. Kelly Olynyk got his starting spot and was wonderful. 21-6-4, two steals, two threes. This is what Olynyk can do if given any kind of wiggle room. And I have to believe that this dude they brought in on a multi-year contract is going to be given some kind of opportunity with Detroit. I just don't know when. With that in mind, you got to stick with him. Even if you put him on your bench for a little bit, I know he's only getting like 20, 19, 20 minutes a game when Grant is healthy, but at some point, they're going to have to plop him in there for some backup power forward minutes along with his backup center minutes and get him to 22, 23, 24 a game, maybe even more than that. And the upside then, we all know, is significant. Isaiah Stewart played better, not surprisingly, because Olenek wasn't backing him up, and he had a little bit more freedom. And then Sadiq Bey has been kind of a high-volume guy, and that's fine, really, because usage is value, and as long as he's out there just firing away and grabbing rebounds and what have you, then that's good. We still haven't seen Cade Cunningham, although I think it's safe to say he'd probably take Josh Jackson's spot on this particular lineup. Don't really care much about the Atlanta side. Uh, no DeAndre Hunter in that ball game, so Cam Reddish had even a little bit more room to go. He's been firing away so far, and I guess you can roll with it, although I'm, I'm struggling to believe that this is a thing that can stick all season in his somewhat more limited bench gunner role, but that's where we're at right now. Washington had a horrible offensive game. Uh, Howell Neto got hurt, but nobody cared really from a fantasy standpoint outside of super deep leagues bradley beal came back but didn't look right he's rusty 
still trying to sort of shake off the early season cobwebs. And this was just all in all a, an ugly game all the way around. You're not, we, we learned literally nothing from this ball game. Chicago beat Toronto in a tight one. Uh, Raptors' Chris Boucher, bad again. Just five minutes in this game. He's so deep in Nick Nurse's doghouse right now. But, you know, we actually talk about this a little bit later in the podcast, but I do want to put out there, you cannot drop a guy with his upside. Because the guys that everybody's asking about on the waiver wire right now are guys that might squeeze their way into the top 100 in a best-case scenario, but most likely will probably piddle along. They'll have like a top 90 week and then a top 140 week and then a top 80 week and a top 130 week. Those guys are useless. Okay, fine. That's not useless. That's not fair. Those guys have a usefulness in head-to-head leagues because they're not putting up zeros. We talked about it before. Somebody's giving you basically zeros. They are, they're, they're detonating your head-to-head team, and that's kind of where Boucher is right now. So I get it. If you have him on a head-to-head roster, he's eating your team. He's cannibalizing your team from the inside because you can't put him on an IL slot. But you just you have to wear this a little bit longer. He has the makings of that early season drop that haunts you for a decade. I'm not saying he will get it going. And you guys know I was never a massive Boucher proponent, but I ended up with him in one or two spots because he fell so damn far on draft day. The upside is crazy. This is why he had all that hype last year, because all he needs is 20 minutes to be a top 75 guy, and then anything beyond that is just gravy. Now, right now, not close to 20 minutes. Got there, got somewhat close in one or two ball games, but getting outplayed by Precious Achua, getting outplayed by Kemp Birch, terrible shot selection. Like, there's all these things that Nick Nurse is looking at and going, I can't put you on the floor while you're doing this stuff. And they're going to try to sort of beat it into his head, be better, play winning basketball, or you will not get minutes this year. Guys usually respond to that. Will he? Won't he? I don't know. Like, what are the odds that I say he gets to top 75 this year? I don't know. 50-50? Chloe here with Cross Country Mortgage. Against all odds, CCM has just closed the Garcia's dream home in 21 days. I was able to speak with their top loan officer before they went into the locker room, and he said it was a matter of dedication. Ultimately, they leaned on their experience as a team. They've been here before. They've done all types of loans. Simply put, CCM loan officers know how to close as a team for your dream home. Cross Country Mortgage is dedicated to getting it done. Back to you in the studio. Cross Country Mortgage, LLC, NMLS 3029, www.nmlsconsumeraccess.org. Equal housing opportunity. Can't drop that because the other guys on the wire don't have a 50% shot of being a top 75 guy. That's just the way it is. If you miss out on crap, I don't know, Uh, three weeks of streaming Pat Connaughton, it's not going to kill you. I promise. I promise. The guys that people are hitting me with questions about, the streamers, should I, you know, should I pick up Carmelo Anthony? Fine. He might be better. He is significantly better than Chris Boucher today. But we all know what these guys are and what they can be. Doug McDermott, like, these are Grant Williams. These are questions that come, and, and I get it. Those guys will be better for your head-to-head team right at this moment. But none of them has the ceiling of Boucher, and that's why I'm not telling you that this is going to work out. But what I'm telling you is that the guys you're considering are not, probably not going to be on your team in three weeks anyway. So you might as well just stick with the dude who has a chance to make a a positive difference on your fantasy team. And again, knowing it might not work. Orlando, Miami, not a whole lot there. Tyler Hero had nine assists. He's been on a pretty good run to start the year. The lack of defensive stats and knowing that the field goal percent is coming down, I continue to be very worried about that whole thing and the way it shakes out. You guys know I wasn't that high on Kyle Lowry this year. I believe I described him on a podcast as too old for the old man squad, which is not an age thing. It's just sort of the game. His game has gotten old. Jonas Valanciunas, 2020 club. Like that. Gotta like that. Nothing else from this ball game that moved the needle fantasy-wise. Cleveland at Denver. Uh, Darius Garland came back, played 31 minutes, and was not really that engaged in this ball game, but they won, so I don't think anybody cares how they got there. Ricky Rubio got 25 bench minutes, which seems like that's probably about his role when Garland's healthy. 
And it looks like that'll be enough for Ricky right now. So hang on there. Michael Porter Jr. had another quiet one. You're holding there or you're buying low. And the Clippers blew out the Blazers. Terrence Mann had a better ball game, but only 25 minutes. That's generally not going to be enough. He's not going to get five boards, five assists, and five defensive stats in 25 minutes every night. Uh, he has lost time to Nick Batum. Reggie Jackson took 20 shots, and I know this wasn't a good ball game for him, but he needs to be rostered. And Eric Bledsoe also missed a bunch of shots, but he too is the guy I would trust because those guys first are starting, and they just it's just the path to minutes. Now, that's not to say Terrence Mann won't make it back on a roster. If he can climb back up into that 27 to 29 range, you could convince me. But dude had a usage rate of 13 in this game, which was second lowest only to I'd prefer not to have usage Nick Batum. Well, maybe I guess Zubats was right around 12 also. Uh, and that's it's really hard to hold fantasy value when you're just sort of not involved. I like Terrence Mann. He has a chance, but I don't think he needs to be on rosters right now. Oh, and by the way, on the Portland side with no Norman Powell, the word on the street there was that he's dealing with knee soreness that's not considered that serious, but we haven't given any kind of timetable. And it seems like Nas Little might be worth a stream in the interim. He's also a very low usage guy, but played 32 minutes in their win. And that is often enough when you're... That's why we just talked about with Terrence Mann. Getting back into the high 20s, I'm all about it. But again, I don't want to spend that much time on the Monday card. You guys, I'm sure, have been bugging me about it on Twitter anyway, and I love to answer those questions. I want to make sure that we get into sort of the big stuff today, which is talking to Adam uh, and making sure that that we're making the right choices on all of our stuff. And before we get into Adam, I want to remind all you guys, first of all, thank you again to everybody that over the last 24 hours dropped a five-star review on the podcast. I continue to be unbelievably appreciative of you guys. It means the world to me. If you want to write something, again, that's great. Doesn't have to, but please do take a moment to drop that five-star review. I, uh, I I really am forever grateful to those that, that do it. Uh, oh, we got a few that actually wrote stuff. Let's see if anything's funny. Oh, somebody noted that they were a Dodger fan. What up, Nick Romo? Go Dodgers next year. Going to be a weird offseason for us. You guys just write nice things. I appreciate that. <laughs> you guys are nice. Seriously, if you write something silly, I'll probably read it. Oh, hey, here's one from uh, October the 17th. Dan is a great analyst, but would be more interested in hearing the opinions of Dan's twin, Ban Despris. <laughs> Thanks, Ponzo. See? Say something silly. I'll get you on the pod. Appreciate you guys. Uh, again, you can follow me on Twitter, at Dan Despris, if you have any questions about any of this stuff. And I know we just rolled through that Monday results in a bit of a lightning round, but I've got things I want us to do on the show. I'm just going to quickly do the intro here. Adam, what's up, dude? Welcome back. Thank you. Good. To, it sounds like you're a bit of a trooper at the moment, fighting through uh, nah, I'm fine. these these pods every day. So, um, yeah, it's a pleasure to be here as always. Yeah, 26 uh, out of 26, 26 out of 31. I'm almost there. I'm almost at the finish line. My kids are giving me colds now, but I'll push my way through it. We'll be. I'll be all right over here. It's a uh, it's a podcast. You know, if you can't do a podcast, what the hell? I've had people, I don't want to go down this path too long, but I have people that are like, I can't do a show today because I feel sick. I'm like, come on, man. Take a Tylenol. It's a podcast. <laughs> Who are you complaining to? I've done like 1,500 episodes of this show. And I used to do baseball games four hours long with colds and flus. You can handle it, people. We're all tough enough. Anyway, um, not your debut on the show, obviously. We've talked to Adam King many times. The great Adam King from... Right here at Hoopball, he is at Adam King ninety one on Twitter. But it is the debut today of our semi new segment. Not that we haven't done a mailbag before on this show, but it's kind of like a weekly or a bi weekly. Let's talk about the big things that people are asking about. Not a great name for it, I know. But uh, Adam, you came to me with this idea, and I thought that's great. That's a great way to break up the week a little bit. So it's not just the monotony of here's yesterday, here's tonight, here's what's going on. This is a way to tap in to what all of you guys, the listeners, are thinking about. So, if you did get a question in this week, congratulations. We are going to pick the best of the best and answer those. If you did not get a question in this week, follow the two of us on Twitter, at Dan Bespris, at AdamKing91. Uh, roughly, I would say every Monday or so, we're going to open up a thread on social media where you guys can reply with your questions 
if you're asking really hyper specific questions about like a trade you're considering, we're probably not going to cover that. This is to dive into to really figure out what the big topics are because we can try to read the tea leaves as best we can. But when it comes right from you guys, then we truly know better. So, Adam, are you ready to open up this Twitter thread we started and see what the hell came our way? Yeah, I think so. Let's let's see uh, if we can help some people out. All right. So I'm going to start with uh, a question from Josh King, who I think actually was briefly with us here at Hoopla. I might be getting that wrong. Uh, Josh said, how soon is too soon to morph your team into a particular punt build that you didn't foresee immediately after the draft? I mean, this is a really, this is like high level stuff here. Parsing through the first week of the season is primarily about not overreacting. Is that true for deciding to lean into punt builds as well? Adam, you do a lot of punting right from the outset. What about teams that maybe you weren't intending to? When do you start to pivot into that? And then I'll give my take maybe more from a roto standpoint. Uh, look, yeah, that's a it's a good question. And, and I'm not sure there is a, a sort of a one and fits all. Um, so I think probably, probably now is a bit too early, um, only because... I think it's been, what, a week? So most players have only played three games. Some have played four. Um, we're still figuring out rotations and minutes. Um, pe- I mean, look at Damien Lillard. He- he's been trash, and he's not going to be trash. So there's still a lot to change um, over the next few weeks. So I wouldn't be doing it yet. Um, also because, as we've seen on Twitter and, and in Discord, and you would have seen it as much as me people are panicking already so oh yeah you you can get some pretty crazy players off off the waiver wire um for the first couple of weeks uh i've seen al horford dropped um yeah what i've seen (laughs) kelly alinic dropped um they're just two off off the top of my head um desmond bain was dropped in one of my leagues last night i don't Hmm. know why um so if you if you went into the season with a punt in mind and it and it didn't play out as you had hoped in the first week, uh, which often happens. I mean, I punted it as people would know in most of my head to head league, or I didn't win all my matchups last week. Probably within I don't know maybe maybe three weeks you'd probably start considering it. I think that would be a an okay time to to go. Okay, well I'm actually strong in these categories and I'm I'm not very good in these categories and start throwing some trades out um, and and getting some guys off the waiver wire because the waiver wire often becomes, as as I just sort of touched on, it, at the moment it is you will find players that can help you and, and have value, whereas later in the season it gets harder to do because everyone's settled into their roles. Um, and then obviously right at the end of the season that will flip again when teams start um, tanking and resting players, and, and so you will find value then. But by then, it's too late. So, yeah, such fun, such fun yeah. at that point of the season. I will, I'll add on the roto side here because I think in head to head, I I'm not actually that well versed in head to head mid season punts. If I'm going to do a punt in head to head, I'm going at it full bore on draft day. And by the way, uh, at your sort of tutelage. I tried a couple of punt big uh, teams in head-to-head leagues this year. I I ended up in more leagues this season than I intended to. And uh, I think it's going okay so far. The spots where I have Bradley Beal, that I generally lost points. Um, But, of course, you know, when you're a first-round guy, the guy you're counting on to score 30 misses most of the first week. That's going to put a little bit of a hole in you. I also found myself running into the issue of perhaps drafting too many guards and not enough big men. So I have these sort of lopsided lineups on days when everybody's playing. I think, you know, you're you're basically looking at like Wednesdays where that ends up kind of biting you a little bit, but I'll I'll do some tweaking on that front. As far as the Roto side goes, to answer the question of, of, again, the question is, uh, when would you kind of lean into a punt by accident almost? And for me in Roto, it's about two months into the season, which I know sounds like a really long time, but I assure you, That's still only about 33% of the way through. It's almost a six-month NBA season these days. I think it's like a week short, maybe even a little bit less than that. It's like a week short of six months. That's a ton of basketball. 
So from the Roto side, a couple of points. It's good to lag a few games behind everybody else in the games played column. I would not have advocated that last year with COVID and everybody missing time. I think that's less of an issue this season, so you can lag back a little bit. Also, it's pretty easy to, as long as you're not like getting steamrolled in a particular thing, it's pretty easy to spot the areas for a return on your investment, the ROI of leaning into a point. I'll use one example, and then we'll move on to the next question. An example for me, a couple years back, I actually didn't intend to punt points in a particular league. I had a couple of guys at the beginning of my draft that were relatively decent scores. I think I had like Clay Thompson in there. It was a season he, when he was still playing basketball. Um, wasn't hurt yet for you know, a long time. But by midseason, I realized I was third from the bottom in points. I certainly wasn't good. I wasn't the worst. I wasn't punting it, but I wasn't good. And what I realized in that moment was, look, I was like third from the top in steals or blocks or rebounds or whatever it was. Or I think a couple of them. So I thought, all right, look, I can move Clay Thompson. My team is fine in three-pointers. It, it might hurt me a little bit, but it's not going to change things that much at this juncture where picking up someone who might be more of a block-friendly player, I could make up two, three points in that category quickly. And if I make up one in rebounds or one in steals or whatever else it might be from this trade-off, suddenly I can only drop two more spots in points. And I had three or four or five to maybe gain in a different category. So there's still plenty of time a couple months in. Head-to-head, you probably want to make that, that move sooner because people are going to start to kind of shore up their own teams as the year goes along. But no one ever really notices when someone's leaning into a weird build in Roto. And said I was going to be done, but I wanted to add one more thing. And uh, you can steer your team into different categories too. You can like add a few extra forwards if you feel like you have ground to make up in a particular thing. So there's a lot you can do on the Roto side. I love the strategy there. Really good question from Josh to get us started on this thing. And we can now go to question number two. Uh, At what sample size do you start to panic on, guys? Because, Adam, you mentioned that people are panicking right now. Um, This is from Eric B-Ball 3. I'm assuming it varies by value. You're right, Eric. Uh, He used PJ Washington, Larry Nance, Slow Mo as different examples, MPJ as another example. Uh, I just talked for a really long time. I was going to try to go first on question two, but people have heard my voice for too long here. So, Adam, I'm going to go back to you on this one. What's when do you start to panic on guys? And I think Eric's probably right. It probably is different based on what what you're expecting of a player. Yeah, it is absolutely. I mean, I touched on on Damian Lillard earlier, and you're not going to pa- panic on him now and go, "Well, he's done. He, he's not going to be who I thought he would be," and trade him away because we know that there's a fifty point game coming. Um, potentially this week. Uh, and, and so... Yeah, they play the Clippers so, again, I think. So probably that one. Probably that one, yeah. So look, it, it does depend on on uh, where you drafted them, where they're projected, where they're ranked, all that sort of stuff. So for those top-level guys, um, I think Michael Porter Jr. is another one. Uh, we have seen a lot of people... Um, well, actually, it's in the in the question, isn't it? So, it is. Um, frustrated with, with MPJ, which, and I get that. I have MPJ in a few teams and um, I'm hoping that he turns it around uh, because it's not, it's not looking great so far, but you can't be dropping him um, obviously because he was probably a fur, or probably not a first, but a second round pick or a third round pick uh, trading him away. I guess you could consider it, but you'd still want to be getting probably equal value back in terms of, where a player was drafted. So if you drafted MPJ at, at pick 30, you would want to get a top 30 player back um, at the moment. Whereas someone like uh, Larry Nance or, or PJ Washington or Kyle Anderson, there are other players that we get a lot of questions about. Um, and I think once you get back down into that sort of 100 range or, or even a little bit lower than that, the the difference in value, as we know, from the, the 90th ranked player to the 140th ranked player is, is not much at all. So you're really looking at, at what needs you have at the moment. So 
if you drafted Larry Nance, you're probably you probably drafted him hoping that you would get some rebounds and some steals. He's not really doing that at the moment. So it, you sort of think, well, okay, I can drop him and maybe I can pick up PJ Washington, who's on the who's might be on the waiver wire, or or Kelly Olynyk, who was dropped. Um, so I'm okay with with dropping them now, but only if you can find an adequate replacement. I, I, I think the the thing that I try to tell people is don't just drop a player because they're annoying you and being and, and frustrating <laughs> you and, and not not living up to expectations. No, that's a really that's actually a really good way to phrase it. A lot yeah. of people are like, I'm annoyed with this guy. I want to be rid of them, but that's not always the most prudent thing. And yeah, I mean, there's there's sort of a sliding scale with this type of stuff. May, let me ask you a follow up question, Adam, and then I'll weigh in on my own side with this. In talking about Michael Porter Jr., I don't think anybody is considering a drop on MPJ. What about the idea of do we? How long before we readjust our expectations on a player like that? For me, it's quite a bit longer than what we've had right now. Yeah. But there's probably a point at which we'd say, okay, well, maybe Michael Porter Jr. Look, he's outside the top 120 right now. That's definitely not going to hold. His volume is down. He's missing his shots. Like everything is is way off kilter for this dude. But how many games into a season before we're like, well, maybe he's more like top 40 instead of top 25 or he's more like top 45 or something like that. Uh, I think for me, that's probably like 20 games in before I'd even consider something like that with a player of his caliber. What about you? Yeah, so what 20 games is probably what a, that's a bit over a month, maybe yeah. five weeks, um, five or six weeks. Um, I think it can, with this, it can, you can probably sort of lean into that roto and head-to-head discussion a little bit as well because, and I think a good example would be uh, Chris Boucher, who's a player we're getting asked a lot about, do I drop Chris Boucher or do I not? And you and I are coming from different perspectives on that question. So I've said to people, I'm okay with dropping him if if you are picking someone up off waivers who is worthwhile again not just dropping him because he's he's annoying and you don't like him anymore um <laughs> so funny. But, but that's in a head to head so in a roto league uh and I talked about this on the um wagering podcast that I was on last night bold statements roto, bold predictions with the great yes, Keith Cork that was and that was odd doing a podcast late at night for me it was something I haven't done before yeah hanging uh, out you were hanging out with a uh with an east coaster so it was his morning right yeah. or no <laughs> Yeah, it was six in the morning for them. So, um, so for for someone like a Boucher, I, I, I'm, my answer is sort of yes, I'm okay with it if there is someone worthwhile picking up. In a roto league, you've basically got three or four IR spots, not tech, not sort of officially, but you can use them as IR spots. And so with Boucher, who who has that top sixty upside, you probably don't drop him in a roto league yet. So I think it does depend a little bit on your format, but for these higher level guys, yeah, look, I'm trying to wait about a month at least. And then once you get down into the top 100, um, I don't know, you give them two or three games, maybe maybe a week. And if they're not doing what you thought they would do, I think the question I ask myself is, is there a chance that this guy comes back to haunt me later in the season? So could he bust out and be a top 50 player? If the answer is yes, then you probably want to go. Okay, I'll hold for a bit longer. If it's if it's no, and it's the answer is I could probably stream anyway and get more value, then I'm okay with dropping them. Yeah, that's a that's a really great final point. By the way, I want to grab onto something that you said kind of in passing. There, uh, all of the roto leagues I run have five bench slots and no IR slots, and people mm. are like, "Why do you do that?" I'm like, "Because these are stash slots, basically." Uh, I do make the games cap higher than 82. Often, I actually used to go 90, but now that everybody sits half the year, it, I, I've lowered it to 86 to 88 range. But that at least brings one or two bench guys into the mix. But they're like, oh, where do I put a guy when they're hurt? I'm like, you just put them on your bench, dude. You don't need the IR. And then you don't have to worry about pick up, drop, pick up, drop, when all that. Like, you're not worrying about whether or not Yahoo thinks a guy is going to be out for three games or not. But anyway, that's a rant for an. Uh, I guess I did it today, but I could do a longer one on another day. Yeah, I mean, that's the the regrettable drop. Avoiding the regrettable drop, I think, is one of the really key elements 
of early season fantasy. One that will haunt me for my life was Rob Covington four years ago when he got off to that. He was shooting 19% after about the first two and a half weeks. And suddenly I had like three guys hurt on my team and I had to start somebody. And I was like, okay, well, I don't want to throw, I don't want to cut my hurt guys because I know they're going to be really good. And right now, Rob Covington is just dropping my team to the bottom of the ocean. I cannot start him. I don't know what to do. And I dropped him. And two weeks later, his shot started falling and he was top, I think, 35 for like the next four and a half months straight. Now, that's not to say that's what you need to do with Rob Covington because everybody calls me the Rob Covington guy, and I was for a really long time. I actually had him much lower this year, and I don't know that people actually heard me say that. He's going to do better by totals than by averages. Different point also. The point I'm trying to make here is don't drop a guy with that sort of ridiculous potential, and I know that right now, you know, Boucher's a really good example of that. I'm benching him. I don't think, like, you can't start him right now because he's barely playing. But we also know that he's barely playing because he's pissed off his head coach. So that's a thing that can be fixed. And he also is top 75 in 20 minutes per game. So it's not like it takes this massive, we got to get him into the starting lineup. We got to get him 32 minutes a night thing. We need him just to come off the bench and back up two positions for 10 minutes each, which is achievable. Uh, So that's one to me where I think we really could regret it. Whereas, like you said, um, you know, I like Larry Nance Jr. a lot. I drafted him in a lot of places, but I drafted him at like 140. Nobody was fighting me for Larry Nance Jr. And if I drop him right now, nobody's going to be fighting to pick him up. So as much as I love him, I'm okay with moving on from Nance. He has probably top 80 in a perfect world upside. And I think he does get closer to that as Chauncey Billups and, and the Blazers realize the things he can do. But again, there's this sort of sliding scale thing. What's going to happen if you drop this guy? Is someone going to pick him up? Are you going to regret it later? How long before you sort of readjust what you're expecting of someone? Uh, really good question there as well. And hopefully we, we hit on a, uh, a few of those things. Uh, we got, I thought, a pretty good question. I know it's more roto than head-to-head, but I'm, gonna, I'm bringing you into it anyway. This is from uh, Carol. I'd love some in-season roster management tips in roto, in particular early season. Do you play your hot waiver wire pickups? Do you actively seek to be behind in games played? Are there stats that are better to accumulate up front because they're more difficult to overcome? I know you don't do a ton of roto, Adam, but any thoughts on roster management? No, look, this is actually one that I would like to hear your answer on because I'm not in many Roto Leagues. I probably do one or two a year. I think I'm only in one this season. Um, and my my strategy that I do is that I, I try to go... I try to sort of plan ahead so that I'm hitting my games limit numbers, whether it's 82 or 85 or 90, basically in that last week. But I've never really won doing that. And there's you, you always see these teams that just basically throw all their players into the active slots early in the season um, and they get way ahead in their games played, but they also get way ahead in their, in their stats. And I think that it, to some degree, to me, that does make a bit of sense because come the end of the season there's a chance that your main guys like a Bradley Beal or um, a Shea Gildas Alexander are benched or are being load managed or whatever it might be. And so you're then having to throw in these names, these players that um, you wouldn't otherwise be, be activating. So I'm not sure like from your perspective, I suppose, what, what do you do? Do you do what I do where you, you plan it out and you go, okay, there's, this player's got 12 games left and I've got 15 spots, 15 games left in that spot. So I'll manage it so that it's I'm ending right at the end of the season. Or do you go a little bit top heavy? So I actually lag back a little bit. Um, mm-hmm. Early in the season, I try to exclusively play guys that are going to be in the top 95 range or better, which I know sounds simple enough. But if you have somebody that's off to a little bit of a slow start, it almost doesn't matter who they are. I'm willing to just put them on my bench for a couple of games. I don't mind falling behind by a little because I want to make sure that every game I get in Roto is, and I've used this metaphor before, kind of pushing the ball forward. 
You can have those fill-in guys anytime. They're always available on the wire. I don't need a fill-in level top 115, top 125 type performance where those guys actually are pretty useful in a head-to-head league if they're playing, you know, all four games in a given week. You have four games out of a guy at that clip. That's helpful where in a roto league, that's actually not that helpful. You're kind of using up games played on someone that's not super useful for your team. Now, uh, in terms of kind of waiver wire pickups and who I play. Yeah, I don't really discriminate on where I find a particular guy. I picked up Eric Bledsoe in a bunch of spots, and I've thrown him straight into my lineup. And that's actually allowed me to bench someone I drafted who I was higher on but just isn't playing as well right now. Like, I basically swapped Eric Bledsoe in for Reggie Jackson in a league because Reggie looks good. He's getting a ton of usage, but he's also shooting like 32%. So... Fine, I'll I'll sit him for a night or two when he's goes on a forty six percent tear for a couple of weeks, and I can flip him back in there. And in terms of stats that are easier to accumulate, you know, we all kind of know like blocks are the rarest of the stats. Steals and three pointer steals are behind, and three pointers. You kind of work your way up the board. Uh, it's why I end up punting points in so many leagues because it flips the board because it makes these other stats so easy to get. And then you're not chasing guys just because they take shots. It's also easier to work on your percentages that way. You really only need like one or two high-volume, good percentages guys if the rest of your team doesn't score. (laughs) They're not going to have any impact on those. Uh, So I I love all the strategy in Roto. I love looking at how my team is doing by averages. I've told this story on the pod before as well. I had a team where I benched Damian Lillard for a week in March because I needed to make up ground and rebounds. That was it. I I looked at the board and I was like, I need like six extra games here from guys that are going to get eight rebounds or more. And I can probably gain a roto point where Dame is obviously the far better player. But in my instance, I was able to attack a particular category. So there, there's a billion things you can do. In terms of just roster management, lag back a tiny bit. Uh, let everybody else use up games on guys that maybe aren't helping them very much, and you will pass them later. You have to get over that mental hurdle of not being in first place for a long stretch of the season. It's easier said than done, but trust your Excel spreadsheet with averages and roll from there. Uh, I had one more... And then I lost it. I had one more really good question. Oh, there it is. Okay. Uh, This is going to be our last question because I figured we would go in depth on a lot of this stuff. Uh, This is from... Oh, I forgot to say who submitted that last one, didn't I? Who submitted that? Uh, No, I said it was Carol. Um, This last one is submitted by Dr. Strangelove. And I'm going to reformat this one a tiny bit because he's asking, are you regretting some of your draft picks or decisions? I actually want to flip this one. Because I actually, I don't really regret many of my picks or decisions, frankly. I feel pretty good about where I'm at with almost every one of my teams. Although I admit some of my punt teams, I'm looking at them like, I know I screwed this up and Adam will tell me how. But the, in my Roto Leagues, I feel generally okay. Uh, here's, my, here's my revamped question, Adam. Was there anyone you were really high on coming into draft season and then the community kind of talked you down off of that guy and now you're pissed about it because I have one and his name is Al Horford I ended up not getting him I got him in one place after banging the Al Horford drum the whole damn offseason because I kind of got I kind of got scared by the Robert Williams uh mega crew and and now I'm sad that I only have one big Al did that happen to you with anyone um yeah, it's an interesting one because I mean we always get we always get the flip side of that where players that that w- we take higher than than what people are are talking about and and it pays off for us or, or we talk people into right. taking other players. Um, look, I think one probably given that so with a lot of my punt builds, I've I've punted. Uh, big men um, this season, so I've gone really guard heavy, uh, and and I'm pretty happy with the teams I've got. But I think one player that I'm probably and I could probably say this actually for the last couple of seasons Chris Paul is probably one um, who is often sitting there for me to take with my second pick or even maybe my third pick yeah and I I just I I I don't know like you just hear the people talking about oh this season the, the Suns have 
they know how to win now um, and they're sort of – they've got to the finals. So this season they really want to cash in on that um, and, and have Chris Paul healthy because we know he wasn't healthy um, during the playoffs last season. So they want to have him healthy. So they're going to rest him. So far, he's looked really good again. Yeah, uh, and, and he really has. So I don't have him anywhere. And that happened last year as well. And, and he's probably one that just jumps out at me um and i'm just sort of scrolling through the the rankings so i love that Um, yeah i mean i was sort of part of that but then you probably heard on on some of my shows where i was like i don't my my whole plan this year was chris paul i figured he would get drafted in the early 20s this year and i was gonna pass on him finally after two seasons of being the chris paul guy and then there he was in the 30s again because everybody was like nah Nah, it's the it's the end of the line. And I did actually end up with Chris Paul in a few spots because I thought, well, here we go again. Like, even if he doesn't have that great of a season, getting him in the 30s is still a crazy steal. But yeah, I hear you, man. There was a lot of there was a lot of anti Chris Paul chatter. Uh, I listened to some of it, but I was able to ignore more of it than you. So I feel at least pretty good about it. It's weird. Like, I don't, I don't know if people realize that analysts, we, we all talk to one another so often that it's very easy to just have little thoughts creep in. And like, mm-hmm. I, after watching, I watched that Celtics game on, I think it was Sunday. They were on NBA TV, if I'm not mistaken. So we had that one just rolling here in the house. Uh, and I watched Al Horford and I was like, oh my God, why did I get off of my Al Horford position? Like this guy, he looks great. He makes them better. They're they they were moving the ball better with him on the court. Like I I think Robert Williams will find his footing. So I, I don't want to act like that's about to implode. But uh, yeah, Horford's gonna play for that team. So I, that's fine. You don't have to. Di- I didn't tell you that question was coming, and it's a weird one to think. Who did you get talked out of that? Now you regret. Did you hmm. find anyone else while you were scrolling? No. Look. No. Not. <sighs> No one that I overly regret, but but I would say um, another one who sort of falls into that category is LeBron James. For me, I've never never rostered him really anywhere, um, and I'm you sort of the talk again is there that he this is going to be the year that he that he sits games and his production falls off, and so far again he's looked really good, and um, and maybe Anthony Davis falls into that category a little bit as well. I mean. We're still waiting for him to go to the locker room. Uh, I don't think it's happened yet. Um, <laughs> Give it time. But it feels like it's coming. Uh, but both of them have looked looked really good and, and, and motivated to, to play and to win. Um, so they're probably two other names that I, I didn't really go near this season and maybe I should have in one league. Um, but on the flip side, you get those players that that you're higher on than others and you're prepared to reach a little bit. Um, and and it pays off and and for me at the moment it's Miles Bridges, uh, who who was the sort of his ADP was around 100. I was more than happy to reach up to about 70 or 80 to grab him, which is only two rounds higher. And he's the number one player so far. So it's not going to stick, but it's still pretty cool to say that he's the number one player. Yeah, I'm happy for that dude. I'm glad his confidence stuck. That was my fear with him was would they crowd him out as they got healthy and he said no and he's just that team is so fun man and miles bridges is is everybody's gonna give Lamelo the credit for making them fun but confident miles bridges is a big part of it too because that guy oh my god what an athlete uh yeah. he is he is uh he he and anthony edwards i need to see them in the dunk contest please nba get get people with with name recognition in the dunk contest uh, oh, yeah. And that's, I think, where we'll put a lid on this one. Some really, really good, broad, overarching questions came in, and that's what we're looking for. We want uh, strategy. We want deep thinking stuff. If we didn't get to your question, we'll try to see if we can dig them up and answer them straight up on Twitter. I don't know if I can promise that. There's a lot going on. Uh, but the wonderful, the inimitable Adam King. At Adam King 91 thank you, sir. That was fantastic. I can't wait for our next one. Yeah, that was good. It's nice to have a maybe a regular thing happening so I can schedule it into my calendar and, <laughs> and, make, and not have to move things around. So, no, it was it was good. And, and it's a good time of year to be doing this kind of thing because there are some really good questions coming at us. Yeah, and I think we'll have – and this is just a nice way to take kind of take the pulse of everything going on too and we'll get an idea of what 
what the questions that people are thinking of are and how the season arc leads into those. So again, thank you to everybody for submitting stuff. Uh, again, if you want to submit next time, please continue to do so. Follow us on Twitter at AdamKing91. I am at Dan Bespris. Adam, I will talk to you in a week. Thank you, sir. Talk to you then. Thank you to Adam King. Good dude. Good dude. Looking forward to our segments here. We're trying to do this every week. We're going to try to do it every week. My schedule is dumb. Adam's is more predictable. So if you don't hear from him, it's like 99% my fault. Almost for sure. You can follow him on Twitter again at AdamKing91. Tonight, Philly at New York. Kemba Walker. Really want to see him get involved. He's starting to freak me out a little bit, even more than some of these other guys that are getting dropped quicker, even though I would argue that right now it looks like maybe his ceiling is being lowered more than some of the other dudes that people are upset about. Warriors, Thunder, not a whole lot there that we really need to track. Uh, I know everybody's sort of on giddy watch these days. And yeah, I mean, that's fun. He'll be up and down through certainly the early part of the season. Lakers in San Antonio, not a whole lot of fantasy stuff going on there. We're uh, side-eyeing the Spurs, but I don't feel like there's a whole lot. Houston, uh, yeah, I mean, there's always something with the Rockets, but nothing overly evident. You know me, just praying for all of you guys that have Kevin Porter Jr. that he doesn't ruin your week. And Dallas, it seems more and more like they have four legit starters that are going to have fantasy value. Maybe they'll even give Dwight Powell enough time, although I'm not... Super confident of that. And Denver and Utah. Well, this is a real... Mm, I don't think I have a homework assignment for you guys tonight. What a mess. Watch Philly, New York. Because it should be interesting. Watch Philly, New York live. See what Kemba looks like live. See what Derrick Rose looks like live. Mitchell Robinson against Joel Embiid. That should be... Intriguing. Yeah, Philly, New York. There's your homework tonight. I don't know that we're going to have any real obvious pickups or drops on this card. Which made today... Really, the perfect day to uh, to talk with Adam about some of the big picture stuff in fantasy. Hope that was helpful for you guys. Uh, and if it was, go check out manscaped.com. Use coupon code HOOPBALL20 and get 20% off your order and free shipping for my buddies at manscaped.com. Want to put a bow on this thing because it's a longer than usual podcast. My voice is tired as I continue to battle off whatever it is that my children keep bringing into the house now that... I don't know, inching towards normalcy here in the world again. Didn't miss that. Didn't miss that. I'm Dan Vespers. Thanks again to Adam. This is Fantasy NBA Today, a hoop ball presentation. We'll talk at you tomorrow. I'm sure we'll have something to go over. In the meantime, we'll see you on Twitter. So long, everybody. This has been a Hoop Bowl presentation.